Hi everyone, my name is Dan Linna, and I'd like to talk about AI for Law, a multidisciplinary approach to scale access to justice for everyone. What's the challenge? Well, the challenge is that billions of people lack access to justice. And our vision needs to be that in the future, everyone can be empowered with the legal information they need to obtain access to justice. So our mission to get there needs to be to scale access to justice through multidisciplinary research, development, and education. It's no surprise that billions of people all around the globe are deprived of access to justice. And even in wealthy countries like the United States, estimates are that about 80% of the impoverished and half the middle class and many businesses lack access to legal services. So what's the solution? Well, we need to ask ourselves, what is the rule of law going to look like in a digital world, which is coming upon us very quickly? And when most people on the planet are walking around with supercomputers in their pocket, what is access to justice going to look like in that world? We need to reimagine the possibilities. Yeah, sure, we've heard about here come the robot lawyers. And absolutely, artificial intelligence can, in fact, automate many tasks that lawyers do. And there's many ways we can build these tools to augment the things what lawyers do, that lawyers do to scale the services they can provide. But if we limit ourselves to only reproducing the things lawyers and courts and that we've traditionally always done, we're gonna miss out on huge opportunities to really transform the legal system. Now, there are a lot of examples of tools that legal aid organizations are creating to, to, to help people. Um, tools to help people when they're in eviction proceedings or getting their security deposit back or divorce proceedings. For example, here's a, a chat bot here in Chicago where I am, Rentervention, that people can use to get advice on how to handle uh, disputes with their landlords. So there's lots of tools like this that are making a difference. We're also seeing changes in courts. Uh, courts have not only gone online for Zoom hearings, but they're thinking about what online dispute resolution looks like and changing this notion that we have to adjudicate all disputes and think of different ways to resolve them. Uh, we've seen particular uh, exciting things happen in the British Columbia Civil Resolution Tribunal, where they've created a whole new court that is really focused on this online dispute resolution model. Lawyers are not allowed in many of these proceedings, and the parties learn about their rights and are guided to a resolution of their dispute. Uh, but for evidence of the fact that we need to think about more than just technology, I turn to Chief Justice the Honorable Bridget M. Uh, M. McCormick of the Michigan Supreme Court. And she pointed out during the pandemic that it just made it bare, made it obvious that the lack of technology and archaic rules and processes in our justice system. So you notice there, she's talking about our technology is out of date, but our processes, the way we do things are even more out of date. And we see this all throughout the legal system and legal services delivery. We're out of date and we need an update to rethink what it looks like to deliver legal services. And so what this brings to mind is the idea of the T-shaped legal professional or T-shaped organizations. We need lawyers and other legal professionals who have deep legal expertise, but they need other skills as well. People, process, data, technology skills to help move us forward to scale access to justice for everyone. Now, an example of some of the work that we need is we need to really understand how to measure the quality and value of the legal services that are being delivered. In law, we have a problem in that we are not evidence-based. We do not engage in evidence-based practice. But 120 years ago, law and medicine were in the same position based on a lot of community norms and the way we do things. Now, medicine took an empirical turn. They're very much data-driven. They capture information about outcomes. They look for best practices that produce the best results for people. In law, not so much. We need to change things including so that when we bring technology to different tasks, we know how to evaluate those legal systems with technology infused in them and legal services delivery tools. Now, this is something we're really focused on at Northwestern University, where we have our Law and Technology Initiative. And our mission has been building this a community of researchers and practitioners, sharing research, gathering information about society and, and practitioner needs. So we're doing research and monthly meetings, training workshops, academic conferences and courses. One thing that's really unique about this is the deep partnership with our engineering school. So we have computer scientists working very closely in the work that we're doing. So we're really focused on these problems at the intersection of law and computation. Thinking about law and regulation of technology, 
and really focus on guiding the development of technology as applied in law, in courts, for legal services delivery, in law firms, legal departments, and using computational technologies to scale access to justice. Now, one of the reasons we're also looking at law and regulation of technology is there's a connection here. Maybe you've heard of Lawrence Lessig's uh, saying, code is law. And we're, we're seeing this emerge in different ways where we really need to think about not just as co uh, code as law, but can we represent law as code? What are the different ways in which we might represent law? My colleague, John McGinnis has written about this, the idea of using computation to figure out the algorithm, so to say, for, for law. So people, individuals better understand the law that applies to them. This can extend to personalizing law. Um, my colleague, Sarah Lasky is, is working on a version of rules as code. You may have heard this referred to, but thinking about coding the tax code and how might we develop programming languages that make it easier to represent the underlying law, which could absolutely be used to scale access to justice, access to the law. Uh, and James Grimmelman at Cornell wrote a great article that'll be presented at the ACM CS and Law Symposium in November, 2022, about programming languages and law. And this nicely makes the point that not everything that's happening in this area is AI or machine learning. There's also rules-based approaches. There's also ideas like uh, bringing programming languages to law. We have to think about all these computational technologies and the way that they interact with other disciplines, such as design and data analytics to help us scale access to justice. Now, something else I'll point out why we should be working with computer scientists is the vast amount of resources being poured into computer science projects. Here's a National Science Foundation project about designing accountable software systems. And so they note that Organizations and individuals are usually the ones expected to comply with laws and regulations, but now we need software systems that also must be accountable and comply with them. If we're designing software systems to be accountable with law, we should be able to design tools that can help people comply with law, understand their rights, understand their responsibilities. We need to be working together to learn across this space. Another thing to think about is we always tend to focus on solving the problem after it's happened. And there are huge opportunities here for proactive design. And thinking even bigger, we can proactively design processes, platforms, systems, and products to incorporate democratic principles, human rights, compliance, and the rule of law by design and default. Tremendous opportunities in this space. So some, some of the other things that we're doing here at Northwestern, I've been doing some writing about thinking about how do we evaluate technology tools used in the legal services space. And I think other academics need to get on board helping develop checklists, tools, and other research to evaluate AI for legal services. Uh, my colleague Sabine Brunswicker at Purdue and I are working on developing chatbots, conversational AI tools that can improve access to justice. We're starting off here with comparing the rent intervention chatbot and a couple of versions of it with static FAQs. And this is an example of the kind of randomized controlled trials that we should be doing to evaluate technology tools. Sometimes I hear people say that using technology tools are second class justice. I don't believe it has to be that way. And absolutely, we can develop technologies that are first class tools for people to get first class access to justice. Something else we do at the universe, at, uh, at Northwestern University here is uh, in our innovation lab, where we have computer science students, master of science and law students, working in teams of computer science students, undergraduate, master, and PhD level teams. And we have external stakeholders. And these student teams develop prototype technologies. They actually build technologies. And we believe this is important because it's helping train future generations of lawyers and computer scientists and other legal professionals to help create the future. Um, so this is an important part of that, but it's also helping solve important challenges in the world and helping build the body of knowledge. So I'm just going to flash through a few of the projects that we've been working on. Um, we, we worked with our Bloom Legal Clinic on delivering Know Your Rights immigration information to, to young people and other projects where we've been working with large law firms, for example. Um, we worked with our Cook County State's Attorney's Office on orders of protection for uh, victims of domestic violence. We also worked with Judge Wilfredo Martinez and Thompson Reuters on thinking about how to help judges manage cases, identify cases where human trafficking has been involved. Um, we worked with the Dominican Republic judiciary. They're very interested in how technology can be used to improve access to justice in their country. We helped them create a tool to understand the user experience in different courts so you can better understand the problems, you understand how technology might actually solve some of those problems. 
And again, I'm just highlighting a few of these, going through these kind of quick, uh, but we worked with Thompson Reuters then on another project for extracting and classifying information from court dockets and evaluating classifications for bias. Again, to better understand how these technology tools work when they're being used in courts and to improve legal services delivery. So this is just an example of a couple of classes we're teaching, um, AI and legal reasoning, law of AI and robotics in the law school and, and assessing AI and computational technologies. And also we're teaching computer science students about law, law and digital technologies, law and governance of AI and the science of law and computation. We're not teaching them about the law just to learn the law. We are partnering with computer science uh, researchers and faculty and students so that we can empower them to help us build solutions for society. One other thing I wanted to briefly mention is our partnership here at uh, Northwestern University with the Ideal Institute. My colleague Jason Hartline in computer science and I put on a special quarter on the science of law and computation. Uh, it was a course that we taught in the special quarter on data science and law. And we did different workshops where we brought in computer scientists and uh, law researchers and brought them together to create a space to talk about these challenges and these problems in this space. You know, one of the things that's really unique about computer science and law is it's a bi-directional relationship. We really care in law about computer science and the impact it might have on the profession, uh, courts, delivering legal services. Computer scientists care about the law and the law of uh, technologies that are being rolled out. And they also see the opportunities to do good in society. When you think about computer science and law, in both domains, we have formalized processes, formalized systems of proof, uh, interpretation of written instructions and descriptions, methods for detecting and resolving errors, formalized information flows, and they're both self-referential. There is a lot that these two disciplines can learn from each other, and there's a lot that these two disciplines can do working together at the intersection of computer science and law. Something else that we did uh, after this special quarter on data science and law is we put together a, a monthly computer science and law workshop. And so these are researchers that are really focused on doing deep work at the intersection of computer science and law. And we have a wonderful steering committee that is helping us lead this forward. Uh, and we meet every Friday where we, you can find us on the web, cslawworkshop.org. And we meet the third or fourth Friday of every month. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we are going to have another law and computation symposium in the spring of 2023 at Northwestern. The last one we did was virtual, and we had over 550 attendees from over 65 countries. So there is strong interest in this area all around the world. There is very strong interest in thinking about how do we use law and computation to improve access to justice for everyone. And so we got to think big. There are huge opportunities in this space. We have to do, you know, really think about the opportunity to improve access to justice for billions of people. We have to have the vision that this is possible. This can be done. And then we've got to do the work. We got to approach this in a disciplined fashion. And we can scale access to justice through multidisciplinary research, development, and education. Thank you.